Tangent Tank, Solving the Housing Crisis, a Tangent Original Series. This Tangent Tank dives into the world of prop tech companies tackling the housing affordability and supply crisis. Join our panel of judges, Jeffrey Berman, partner at Camber Creek, Zach Ahrens, co-founder at Metaprop, and prop tech entrepreneur Edward Cohen, as we ask the tough questions and challenge each founder and evaluate their startups based on innovation, potential impact, and scalability. You'll listen firsthand from the founders themselves as they share their stories of determination and resilience. 1.8 billion people around the world do not have adequate housing. Housing affordability reached an all-time historic low in the US as over 10 million renters spend over 50% of their income on housing. Amidst these challenges, there is hope. Across the world, we're seeking startups that leverage technology and talent to tackle this crisis head on. If you are a passionate founder, please apply by emailing your company's deck or video to tangentcommunity at gmail.com. Hi, welcome to Tangent. I'm Edward Cohen. Today I'm joined by my co host, the most seductive podcast voice, Mr. Fortune Magazine May 2023, the PropTech OG himself, Jeffrey Berman. Wonderful to be here. We're also joined by published author, business and real estate history connoisseur, Japan's latest sensation, Sensei Zach Ahrens. Wow, thank you. Pleasure to be here. And thank you for plugging our new PropTech 101 recently translated into Japanese, featuring an interview with Jeffrey Berman. Hi! Did I say that right? Yes, it was an aggressive hi, but... Well, no, I'm sorry. I just used the Hebrew chai. Yeah, you went chai. I went chai. Like you can say like it very affirmatively, you know, like hi, or you can like say it kind of quietly, like if you're just sort of yesing someone. Although in that case, you can also say so, 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 right? Which is another sort of way to say that you're vibing with what they're saying, but just like sort of continue what's going on. So there's, you know, I'm just trying to learn the culture over time, but it's it's been fascinating spending so much time over there. Ugh, jealous. <laughs> you got to come with me at some point. Deal. You can fit me in your carry-on. Well, no, you can purchase a ticket. You're a big-time venture capitalist. We can even sit next to each other and share, you know, snacks and and film selections. Can you imagine the, the, the air hostesses walking by and saying... Wait, are you guys twins? Yeah, are you brother? Yeah, is this a tw is this a twin trip to Tokyo today? Like, no, it's it's strictly business, ma'am. Anyway, sorry, I guess we went on a tangent there. Early tangent, guys. Let's get serious, because today on Tangent Tank we have Tim Swanson, president and CEO of Inherent L3C, transforming lives, communities, and generations through home ownership. Hi, Tim. Hey, Edward. Oh, it's great to be a part of this conversation. I appreciate y'all. Tim, so you're not only a CEO and president of Inherent L3C, you're also a designer, urban planner, innovator, teacher, leader, and entrepreneur. Tim, what's your story? Yeah, well, I, one of the things you forgot there is I'm a, a laborer on our workforce too. Uh, that's typically my primary job these days. Guys, a lot of this is really just looking at what happened to the American dream and what's a 21st century version of it. Uh, the reality of a working class not being able to afford a home or plan for a family or another generation. And so we said, why not try to eat the whole elephant at once and look at redeveloping our cities through housing, through job creation and, and getting people into stabilized, secure housing. Uh, and, you know, why not do it in Chicago? Because it's probably one of the hardest cities in the world from zoning and buildings and, 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 and it's also a city that has 2,000 vacant acres of land uh, prime for families to live on. So uh, that's what we're up to. And that's what we're having fun with. Fascinating. So you're addressing the supply side issues here of the housing crisis, uh, starting with Chicago. And, and if I understand correctly, you're doing it through your low profit LLC. That's right. Now, before our fellow venture capitalists listening to this podcast freak out about the concept of low profitability. <laughs> Wait, do you actually call it low profit LLC? Yeah. What does that mean? What does that look like? So it's a, it's an L3C. It's a low profit limited liability company. And the, the reason for that is that most people generally assume to address housing, you need to be a nonprofit to address housing. It has to be exclusively through subsidy and grants. And we argue differently. Uh, but 
that structure actually doesn't limit profit. What it does, it requires this, this is like a stronger form of B Corp, right guys? So what it means is that I'm audited based on this mission to create careers in our communities and housing in our communities that folks can afford. As long as I do that, then everything else is open game. And so the L3C is stacked in the middle of our three companies. So we have Inherent Invest, which is a proper full for-profit residential developer. And then on the other side, we have Inheritance, which is our NFP, which is all about workforce development and innovative financial tools at the community level. The manufacturing business is the one that sits here in the sort of low profit model, but using each one of those sort of superpowers to best align, right? The L3C is PRI compliant, which means we've been working and partnering with larger scale foundations and philanthropies to look at some of the solutions there because they can make program related investments uh, and come alongside, hedge the risk for a market investor to come and see more market style returns. So it's really a structure that allows for impact investing with closer to market returns uh, by having this leverageability on the philanthropic side. There's profit, I pray, eventually. Jeff, I promise you, I promise my wife. So uh, that's what I'm dealing with. <laughs> so so where are you in your in your company's life cycle? Yeah, so uh, this conversation is about 20 years coming here in Chicago. Uh, I was working with a former Mayor Daly, uh, and we just couldn't get it across the hurdle. So it was all about kind of collecting all the experiences. We first moved into this facility just 13 months ago. So 13 months ago, I had three employees. We're now 20 plus employees that all come from directly from the neighborhood. We're on the west side of Chicago and another half a dozen in, uh, in our sort of management office. Uh, and so since last April, We've acquired almost 60 parcels across the city of Chicago. We've partnered with a couple of organizations and we've just closed on a, another family today. So we're getting working class families into housing in real time, letting maybe the city and the county and the state sort of catch up with us, right? We don't have enough time and patience to, to sort of wait around for that. So 13 months in, kind of falling along, we've got two more houses that are about to go out the door here and we're in conversations with a couple more cities now to give that silver platter, let's create jobs, let's infill housing and build more economies. The future of real estate is here. And by here, I mean at Blueprint in Las Vegas, Nevada, this upcoming September. Join Jeff, Zach and I in the largest, most global gathering of industry innovators leading the charge in changing the built world from construction to transaction. Blueprint is the premier event for industry executives, real estate and construction tech startups, and VCs. Over 2,000 attendees, more than 750 startups and investors, 250 plus speakers from more than 50 countries will be represented in this year's conference. Join the Tangent team this September 11th to the 13th at the Venetian Hotel for three days of networking, learning, and ecosystem advancement. Tangent listeners get a $200 discount by going to blueprintvegas.com slash tangent. That's blueprintvegas.com slash tangent to get a $200 discount for this year's event. Hope to see you all there. So it sounds to me like you're almost trying to do too much in terms of focus and the structure of the company, right? You have the modular manufacturing workforce where you're creating jobs with better than living wage. That's right. You also have the product, which are the homes that you're selling. And you have the a smart home tech suite to empower future homeowners and connect them with relevant vendors. How does that work? How do those those three uh, components come to you? Well, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's sort of both too much and the only way right now. We have a lot of conversations with what if we could do this, but we can't finance it? Or what if we could do this, but we don't have development? Or who's going to buy our product? Or who's going to do this? Or who's going to do that? And so it's sort of the hell with all that conversation. Let's let's have to do it all. Um, so it means sort of the development side, the finance side, the capital stack to build housing and develop housing. The counseling side, and we partner with community-based HUD agencies to get that pie or pipeline into it. And then you touched on this too, Edward, right? This reality that for first-time home buyers, they may be the first in their family to ever own a home. So once we get that family into a home, both to stabilize them and to have some certainty around our product, we stick around with them for the first five years. So we do Jiffy Lube maintenance with them every quarter, right? Teaching how to winterize, summarize, change your filters. These are all electric smart homes. We're collaborating with Google to have all their kit inside the house. Um, we're collaborating with ADT. So ADT is providing five years of monitored security. Northwestern Mutual is providing five years of life and disability insurance. And we wrap that all up around a central point, a central platform point for the family, right? So what does it look like to really become a lifelong homeowner? Well, you got to be able to sort of 
plan for all those first five year risks, right? And so for us, it's about setting that family up for success. The last thing I want to do is create a foreclosure model for first time homeowners. So making certain that they, they're up and to the right is good for that family. It's good for their next generation. It's good for the block that they're on, but it's also good for us as a business so that we actually see that sort of economies being built through the work that we're doing. How are you capitalized so far? So far, it's myself and I've got one other equity partner. We're half and half in the deal. We've spent and uh, put together just about a million and a quarter dollars. And that's gone primarily to payroll and housing. So we self-finance the construction of these housing and this platform. We are now, once this house rolls out the door, we'll be in the black this year and, and start to look at how we stabilize and ramp this facility and go to more facilities. So and so the, you're, you're, you're acquiring the land how? So uh, with uh, redevelopment agreements with the municipalities. So here in Chicago, we have redevelopment agreements with the city of Chicago, with Cook County. Uh, and so we transact with this land that's not been on the tax rolls for 30, 40, 50 years. That's, that's a commonality in a lot of both Rust Belt uh, and other cities, just significant amounts of publicly owned, underutilized land. Interesting. Are, are you eventually going to try and raise venture capital for your, for your business or before you nod and say yes, because what, what's striking to me is you have, you have a niche here because what you're doing is not easy. Right there, it's like it's like as as my friend, colleague, sometime tormentor, but most of all, amazing compadre Zach Aaron's would say, it's like herding cats. I've actually never heard him say herding cats. I've never heard, him say but it it is. But you could he, you could actually see him saying that sounds like herding cats. I actually got allergy tested the other day. I'm de desperately, deathly allergic to cats. So you wouldn't see me hurting them. You would never see me hurting cats. It's my Zach, my Zach Aaron's is fire. Anyway. Yeah. It's as good as your random German prop tech entrepreneur. I think so. So you're so you're you're hurting cats here, which in one sense is a massive opportunity because it's the barrier to entry seems like it's high. Like you have to have the legislative municipal, whatever support that you're, that you're going after. You also have to be able to develop the, the homes adroitly. But at the same time, as a venture capitalist, I look at this and, and I say, well, why would I invest in something that requires so much time for every incremental unit? How do you scale this business? Yeah, yeah. No, I, you're capturing it right. Like it is literally hurting cats, especially when you play into bureaucracy, right? But it's also wait, to the your cats point, are controlling the bureaucracy. You're you're literally hurting cats. That that would be amazing. That, that's exactly it. they. Their suits are impeccable, but their attitudes are despicable, right? So, uh, but this is this is this is what this is what we see, right? Most people do not want to play in incorporated areas because of the complexity of some of this stuff. Modular manufacturing for us is important, but it's almost more important to create a workforce that has a guaranteed steady job, right? So when we think about the scale, it's not necessarily how do I build the biggest factory possible, but actually how do I build a program that is that sort of silver platter easy button for a city to say, all right, you guys want housing, you want jobs, you want stability, you want all those sorts of things. We put together capital stacks uh, for the business, we put together capital stacks for the buyer, and we put together a workforce platform that actually builds the jobs in your neighborhoods. And so, hold on a second. Is the idea that it's like, I get to build my own home or I get to work in a plant that manufactures cross laminated timber that ultimately gets used in the home that I live in. And because of that, I'm guaranteed to have a job. And then because of that, I can get a mortgage. And then because of that, I can get into one of your homes. And then it all financially works from a, on a company level for the low profit LLC. And then on the real estate level as well, getting outsized returns uh, uh, or, or just standard, I guess, credit, credit level returns on the real estate? Like what kind of jobs, like how does the job creation component of it work and how is it accretive to the rest of your business? In my opinion, the only way it could be is if you're creating the jobs that actually create the supply, quite literally, if you wanna talk about literal and what that word means, and then you're also potentially giving people jobs through this that wouldn't ordinarily have jobs. And because they wouldn't ordinarily have this high paying job, they wouldn't ordinarily qualify for a mortgage. Is that a fair assumption or unfair assumption? No, it's a hundred percent fair assumption, right? It's 
So can you walk us through one of the examples of how this will, because I, this is, this is fundamentally, you know, Jeff sees everything, you know, so he's, he's super innovative and new. And so like, he might've seen this model before, but I've never seen this model before. I've never actually seen a accretive, um, virtuous cycle model where you take workforce housing and you're actually putting the working people into the housing in this way. So and is this a figment of my imagination and a, and a pipe dream for me on the phone with you right now? Or is this the reality of what your business is today? This is the reality, Aaron, of what our business is today. So walk us through the sort of concrete example of that. You know, you don't have to disclose the confidential information of your your homeowners, but but use an avatar of a persona so that our listeners can have a better idea of how all three legs of the stool are symbiotic and therefore add up to five, let's say, instead of four or three. Sorry, Jeff, I can't even, I told you I was bad with numbers on our last session, but I just added one, one, and one and got four. So that's why we have Microsoft Excel in the venture business. Anyway, so you, you get what I'm saying, though. I think our listeners really need to need to understand this on a granular level with a with a with a case study style example. 100 percent. And and to frame that conversation, Aaron, right? Think about I'm butchering the way Henry Ford put it. Right. But his attitude was if my land worker can't afford a Model T, who in the hell can afford a Model T? Right. So we took that posture from housing. Right. If we're actually going to build workforce housing, we need to build a workforce that can afford the housing. That's that's ultimate priority to us. What we also found and why we have such a deficit of folks going into the trades, who wants to go into a job when maybe one or two days a week you don't have work because it rained or it's this or it's that. It's all the reasons why we're trying to find innovative trade solutions. But at the same time, it's 65 and sunny in here, which means for me, from a priority perspective, my workforce is stable. They know where they're going every single day. They have a paycheck. They have a 401k. They have benefits. They have paid time off. It looks and acts and smells like a real job, right? Now, from there, if we size this model right, then we're not extractive in our labor, right? So if my workforce is getting paid a thriving wage, we start here at 20 bucks an hour plus bennies, um, that looks a hell of a lot better than what I would get if I'm just entering the trades, right? The vast majority of our workforce have never had a trade job filled this spot right here. And we've also matriculated some of our folks onto the apprentice programs in the unions, right? Because folks that weren't ready to get a job in the units now have built two, three, four, five houses. They're now ready. They're, they, they look good on paper there. So it becomes this pipeline from our neighborhoods that need housing. I'm in a neighborhood right now that's 28% unemployed. Uh, and so I can take somebody that's ready to show up to work and get them into a high paying job so that they can afford the house that they can. Well, if I do that math, right, our first two families that we just closed with, uh, these families are making that sort of average income for the city of Chicago, that working class income. They now own their home. We've got some of our folks that are now going through a HUD counseling agency so they can buy maybe not the home I'm standing in today, but the home that'll be here six months from now. And so it has to be both accretive to that household, to that worker, but also to us as a business. And then single family infill housing in a place like Chicago, you're talking maybe two, 3% uh, margins when you deliver a product like that. We're gunning by the end of the year to be at 15, 16% even, right? So we know that by disintermediating the whole stack by sort of taking the cut as the developer, taking the cut as the designer, taking the cut as a manufacturer, that, that whole thing. I can take a smaller piece of that. I can make enough, but actually have a return and hit a market that's damn near impossible right now to hit, right? For no other reason than there's so many people getting a swipe at that, at that pie, right? So we are a managing broker, right? We transact these houses with our families. We're working on a couple of funds that help offset the cost for some of our communities. So it had to be all the pieces in order to get to that place where I can make it work. So it's both pie in the sky, but it's let's bloody our knuckles to get there a little bit and let's show a better example. Because I don't see one right now. I don't see one that solves the financial model, the building model and the family model in one way that actually means something beneficial in, in cities across our country. We can debate the uh, home ownership versus renting. However, I want to bring up something else which is are all products single family homes uh if so why like is this because of the type of land that you're working with or the type of places or why aren't we going for higher density does reskilling labor for higher density or you know duplexes triplexes multifamily harder or or why why not uh, higher density 
Yeah, yeah. So we've got higher density products in the pipeline. We've got duplexes or two flats, we call them here, three flats, things like that. Um, but we knew I, I, I had to start with that lowest common denominator where I'm going directly to a consumer, right? So I had to close that gap so that I could build these other pieces. You know, some of the challenges that we see and we see in our communities all across the country um, is this idea that we want owner occupied. If it's a two flat, three flat, things like that, we want to have some community ownership in it. And the current lending models actually don't allow for a community residents to account for rental income to get into that house, right? So what we've said is, okay, I got to build a new model to get there. So I'm going to start here. Density is really important to us. But, but Edward, when you, go into, when you go into a city like Chicago, which is the third largest city in the country and it has over 2,000 acres of vacant residential land in it, that's what we're targeting there. We have under-enrolled schools where our first couple of communities were putting 30 to 50 houses around an elementary school. So we're, we're adding a sort of a density that's needed in that neighborhood. And I think oftentimes we get to the place where ownership is not the model anymore or single family is not the model anymore, not because it doesn't work, but because we haven't figured out how to get more families into it. So, so there's so many people that say, I love renting only because, you know, we've seen the memes. We can't wait for the housing crash so I can buy a house, right? And so we're, we're, we have this posture that says we want to focus on localized ownership as best we can. Uh, but rental typologies, other housing typologies are all within the pipeline. But starting with what I control can control day one, or at least the easiest hard problem day one. I would honestly, I would like him to team up with a previous guest of ours, Daniel Dorfman, who's now selling his REIT model in a box. And effectively, your customers can have their cake and eat it too. You don't have to build your own REIT structure, which is complex and hard. You can take this guy's software and his model. He's now selling it to other developers. And you can offer your customers, instead of ownership in just their own home, you can offer the other people who work on the assembly line who may be younger, not have kids yet, and want to rent from a lifestyle perspective, you can actually, instead of having them as renters who piss the money away, you can effectively have them put their money into this REIT, and it's a community level REIT. And so you own property, and you're responsible for that property, but it's not necessarily your single family home. And so it, what we loved about that model um, when he was on our podcast, um, I'm sure you've listened to every single Tangent podcast like three or four times. Um, but um, what we loved about that was, was, was that it enabled this level of flexibility because frankly, in our opinion, you know, home ownership is, is, is not right for a lot of people um, from a lifestyle perspective and even from a financial perspective, uh, depending on how long they plan to own the home for and where a bunch of different factors, where mortgage rates are, what geo they're buying in, et cetera. Um, so anyway, I think we can, we can make, you know, what Mr. Berman would call a, uh, a tangent shidduch, yeah? Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that offline. Well, I, I love that you brought that up, Aaron, because that, that's where my head went when I listened to that that podcast. What we've thought about is for a lot of people, wait, ownership wait, in my wait, box. Wait, 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 wait. Did you just call Zach Aaron? I'm used oh, to it. Oh, it's my I last did. name. I it's my did. business partner's name. I forgot I, to say Mr. ahead of it. I'm sorry. That's, that's right. Sir, is that what it is? Look, look, Mr. <laughs> Aaron, look, Mr. Aaron's was my father. You can call me <laughs> Professor Aaron. That's exactly there we go. right. There we go. That's By the way, I was that's what I was going to say. Sorry. What, that you can call him professor? Yeah. Jeff, it's not a coincidence that we're related. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, no, I, I think it is a coincidence. It is a coincidence, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Tim, keep going. No, no, I love this, right? No, this is exactly it, right? The point is building an equity for an individual, whether or not they own the box they're in uh, outright or they own sort of an entity, they're part of an entity that owns that box. We're all about whatever typology makes sense to get more working class folks into some form of equity creation, into some form of paying their future self. That's what, that, at the end of the day, that's what we're focused on, whether it is sort of a single family house that you own or whether it is part of a larger structure. I'm down for either. I just want to see more equity on the block. And it seems to me that this is not, again, Zach, tell me if you disagree, but this does not seem like the type of model that is necessary, necessarily appropriate for venture capital. It doesn't need venture capital to uh to expand yeah i think the job training and manufacturing component of it is potentially 
scalable if you're manufacturing the right product and you can grow it big enough because those those businesses you got to get grow really really big to get private equity or a strategic interested in in an exit so we debate internally all the time whether we should be funding sort of next gen manufacturing businesses as part of our practice right but is that it would you consider next gen manufacturing to be vet from a venture scale point of view. I mean, again, like private equity scale and venture scale, defining different things. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would say, we. I think if you get in early enough at the right price, yes. I think otherwise, probably not. And then I think for the other elements of your business, it's it's definitely more like patient family office type capital to stand up the, the operating entity. I don't think you need a ton of money. And then, you know, you can see over time which piece of the manufacturing is actually clicking from a scalability perspective. And then, you know, the other the other opportunity, I don't want you to do this because one of my favorite companies in our portfolio is is in this space and, and Jeff doesn't know it yet, but he's going to lead their next round. We have a company called Skillet and they pr- created software that that helps with not only the, the recruiting and sort of valuing of a, of, a, of, a, of a tradesperson, but also the training itself. So if you think about if you think about the labor shortage in the skilled trades, right? And even though we're seeing softening labor market, we're still seeing labor growth in skilled trades. And that's going to continue, especially with all this government spending, CHIPS Act, et cetera. And everybody's starved for labor, um, especially in some of these rural areas where they're building these massive data centers, semiconductor fabs, and there just aren't any people to put down the, the rebar or whatever, you know, to, to pour the concrete, et cetera. So, so effectively we at Metaprop think about tackling that problem from, from two different vantage points and then seeing those vantage points converge over the ensuing decades. One is taking the old model, which is the apprentice model of training, which doesn't really work anymore as we can see, and then scaling it somehow through software. And that's effectively what Skillet is doing. They're saying, we're going to recruit, we're going to train, we're going to make that much more efficient. Um, And then the other uh, thing we're investing in uh, uh, is robotics, right? And it's like, we're still a long way from a robot building a building, but we've come a long way just since we've started the firm in what a robot can do on a construction site. A robot can lay drywall, a robot can make measurements, a robot can paint um, tilt walls. They can do a lot of things that they could not do um, even five years ago on the job site. So um, long story short, anything that can help solve the labor issues and is scalable is theoretically venture backable. But if I were advising you right now, I would certainly, other than me and Jeff on this podcast, I, I certainly wouldn't want you spending your time uh, uh, doing what we call the Sand Hill Road Shuffle, you know, so the meeting people to to meet people who might be capital partners in the future because they may not understand what you're doing at a granular level and and it might be just sort of you know it might not be sort of scalable enough uh, 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 to pique their 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 interest effectively. Well, it, it, that's exactly right, uh, Professor. And <laughs> it is it's the FO right? Like so, it's it's patient family offices that give a damn about whatever city they happen to be in, right? That's the types of conversations that make a lot of sense for something like this because. While there's value in return, it's that sort of larger existential value in return that a that a region needs to solve this sort of big, hairy housing, um, labor, humanity crisis that we deal with on a daily basis. If you ask me, this is an absolute political gift for any politician with a vision that wants to really have an impact, that wants to have bold change in their community. I mean, you are not only creating jobs, but those jobs are you're reskilling, rehabilitating people who did time, delivering housing to house people so they can own it. I mean, where, where like just align yourself with these uh, election cycles, and uh, you know the politician that wants to win uh, might have to work with inherent L three C. Well, it, it, that's it, right? So whether it's here in Chicago or some of our work nationally with HUD, it's about y'all have a disconnect whether you're at the city, state, or federal level, with you say you want something, you fund it, you, you mentioned CHIPS and others, right? Uh, and, and Build Back Better, the Inflation Reduction Act, and then where does it actually hit on the ground? And it's lost in that ether. And this is saying, let's 
I'll be on the ground. Let's connect those dots. And, um, and, and we see the value return in votes <laughs> just as much as it is in dollars, you know? Let's talk about public-private partnerships because I think that's something crucial to your operations, to to your projects, and and how you, you know, found the land, uh, how you're finding the subsidies and all that. And I I do think, especially in today's world where some cities may have too many captains for the same boat and you know paralysis and ingovernability are the norm. What incentives have you been able to align with? public sector that has proven to be successful that we could pro like look to replicate in other places? I, I would say we've had very much an attitude of we're going to go ahead and you guys can catch up with us. And we've seen that, right? So here locally, we've restructured how some of the city subsidy programs for the buyer side actually works, right? So, so that we can get more dollars into a family's pocket. We've started looking at alternative sort of groundworks through TIF and bond issuances, right? These types of tools that carry a lot of value and a lot of salt, but don't always get used to deliver a product. And so where I think I find myself right now is that train is catching back up with us, right? They've slowly built momentum. And now we're going from, can we do one at a time or two at a time or this neighborhood or that neighborhood to how many neighborhoods can you deploy this in, right? It has been that piece. And we are now in a new election cycle, right? Or we're past a new election cycle, at least here with a new mayor and uh, Mayor Johnson who is both progressive and needs and wants to see progress in a city. And so that's what this tool is all about is let's keep on going. These old models, uh, Chicago, I sit in a city with $2.8 billion pledged in what's called Invest Southwest for very high design, um, uh, low income housing, rental housing. And I think that's fine, right? But those residents have no path to equity, no path out of that housing solution. So we're coming alongside and saying the private side through this sort of slightly more complex, but innovative model can actually get somebody who is maybe stuck at the peak of a public housing price point and get them into the next piece, right? So we can keep moving a whole generation up. That's where it's attractive. That's where we've seen the most uh, hay being made uh, on the public side. And that's a conversation that we start to have, to your point with other cities, this idea that you just need to unlock it and you don't know how to. So let us, let us come alongside, right? You know, it's a win for you. It's a win for us. Um, but most importantly, it's a virtuous economy that exists in a neighborhood that so desperately needed that. Fascinating, noble mission. I was reading this piece about how community meetings and approval boards have been sold to us as democracy, but they have they have turned more into just delay, obfuscation, and you know just kind of a this you know we're talking about a virtuous cycle here. This is more of a you know death death loop cycle where. How are you bridging that? Yeah, well, most communities feel that way, right? Most communities feel like we've already had these meetings. We did this last year. We did this last decade. You haven't actually done anything new since then. And so communities get more vocal about it. Where we found with our communities is that we actually did something. I, I was asked uh, by the previous administration here, how many houses do you have to drop in a neighborhood before you see sort of substantive change and value? And I said, one, honestly, like it's not that crazy. One with a promise of more because that's so much more than these communities are used to. Their promise of none with none following after. Uh, and so by delivering and, and, and following in on that model, that changes the narrative from a thousand meetings to how do we get behind you and push this further? Nothing in life is more important than the ability to communicate effectively. The single biggest problem in communication though is the illusion that it has taken place. In property management, integration is how software communicates. What if you could have one integration to rule them all? Propify's unified API lets you quickly and easily integrate with the leading property management systems to save time, ship faster, and unblock revenue. With Propify, your team can integrate with Yardi, RealPage, and other software in weeks instead of months to extract up-to-date resident lists, add charges to residents' payment ledger, and create work orders and maintenance requests. Propify is laser-focused on eliminating integration maintenance and saving you money by enabling the easiest way to integrate in PropTech. To learn how to build, test, and launch multiple property management software integrations, please visit getpropify.com. That's getpropify.com. Let's move on to the last part. Tim, the future of cities, the future of Chicago. What's one aspect 
of Chicago that you would choose to improve and why? And you can't pick housing or workforce. That's that's easy. I don't even live there and I could and I could and I could pick this one. There's only one answer. Actually, there are two. Uh, well, okay, right. Chicago Fulton Market is just down the block from me. It's one of the fastest growing, wealthiest neighborhoods in the country, and we lose fifteen thousand people a year because of crime and education. Right? Crime and education. Damn, I was literally thinking crime right. and education. Right. One and two. Give this man a donut. Thank you. I like donuts. Uh, and and it's those two things, guys. It, and, and sorry, I'm going to break your rules because you just told me not to say this, but. If I've got a neighborhood that's 60 to 80% dirt, right? And then I've got a school that's 20 to 30% enrolled. How in the hell am I going to get enough people in that school to have a valuable education, right? So they go hand in hand. The 15,000 net loss that we see as a city every year is not from people getting that next job in the loop or the West Loop or sort of in, in a high income area. It's folks that are like, so you're telling me I can't even afford to live and the school's not that good. My neighborhood's dangerous and I, I've got a working class job. I'm out. I'm going somewhere else where I don't have to deal with that stuff. And, and it, it's interesting. The the past few guests we've had, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, it's the politics, stupid. It's it's like it's, this is this is not rocket science here. Like you look at the policies that are in place and the politicians that are leading them, and the the, the there's no common sense. And it appeal, it's appealing to the lowest common denominator. And this is not a Republican or Democrat problem, although the, these municipalities tend to be run by Democrats. But I think that just happens to be where we are today. You can look at both sides and say, wow, Mensa candidate? I don't think so. It is staggering when you when you look at business people. Like you're doing something that everyone here, I can I think I can speak for all of us. We're rooting for you because what you're what you're doing could have a demonstrable effect on both a critical issue that we're facing as a nation and also like on the ground, something is just good. It feels good. And you have, I would imagine that you have politicians that are probably more eager to say no because no one gets fired for saying no. And what that ends up happening is you, you continue this downward spiral of crime and poor education and lost opportunity when you talk about that acreage that's available. It's uh, it's just a gosh darn shame, as they say in Nebraska. And it's 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 as obvious as humanly possible. You hit the nail on the head, right? We sit in so many places like, gosh, I wish we could have some more jobs. Wouldn't it be great if people could live someplace? Oh, and we got land. Can't think of anything that solves that problem. Let's put a new policy in place that, and we talk about this all the time. We want more affordability, more access, but 20% of zero is still zero. 30% of zero is still zero, right? If we're not actually... If we paint a stick to look like a carrot is not incentivizing you, right? It's just having a slightly different look on the stick that we beat you with, right? So there is this logic that we need to change a little bit, and and it's it's the politics. That's it. So that's how we would improve everything. Change the politicians. AI politicians. Whoa. Whoa. Don't we do the who who who's his dream investor dream meeting section? Isn't that supposed to happen? We do, but uh, honestly, the last two answers have been too serious and not funny. Like we want funny answers. People are like so, so like focused in the zone. Like I want answers. Like you know, I want to partner with Joan of Arc because she would like be a trailblazer. By the way, partying with Joan of Arc that that partnering, partnering. I wouldn't party. Oh, with partner her. in. I think it's partying. I was like, what? the the last question is supposed to be if you could, yeah, if you could like work with in your business any historical figure who would it be and why and people were like well sam zell it's like obviously sam zell like thank you you know like like mensa we talk about mensa here come on so like we want you to draw deep into the history books here and come up with someone interesting that's not obvious and we'll judge you based on your answer yes of course we'll judge you no i get it right well, here's the thing. I'm going to answer it the way Robert Reich answered it when somebody asked, hey, what, it, what country should America be like if we're not getting it right? And he's like, really easy, 1950s America. Stupid, right? Because in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, we actually incentivized investing in our communities. Do you know what I mean? That's horrible. First of all, do you know that dude is a, is a horrific NIMBY and he actually voted against development in his own community in Berkeley, California? That dude is... Literally the biggest hypocrite in the world. 
So A, you quoted him, and B, the idea of nostalgia for the housing in 1950s America when we were redlining all over the place is ridiculous. And this dude, this this dude should know that because he wasn't he like he was he's been doing this for decades. No, he's he's gonna say Christopher Columbus, like <laughs> somebody not problematic like that. You know what? Some great policy ideas, Genghis Khan. He was on to something, you know. He was great at housing creation. All right, you have another. You have another chance, Tim. Let's let's go. So first of all, I'm not saying that Robert had the best ideas because what he got wrong, to your point, is 1950s America was great if you're a white male, right? And sucked if you weren't, right? So that is the fallacy when we look at that nostalgia, right? We, we're like, oh, wow, it used to be good back in the day. You're like, yeah, for you, it was great back in the day. For everybody else, it kind of sucked, right? Uh, but what you did see at that time was the active energy of the U.S. government saying we should do the right thing by our city. So it's not any one person because I don't think anybody can hold that mantle. We should make this great for white people only. Yeah, not great. Not great. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, and so that, that's where I go to with that answer, right, is that we were like 5% of the way of getting it right, and then we closed the door behind us and didn't let anybody else into the equation, right? So to go into the 21st century, there's some notes that you have to take, but they're on both sides of the ledger. There's the notes that you have to take about how we actually incentivize development, investments, and opportunities in education, infrastructure, workforce. And also, holy crap, we got a lot of that wrong, and we have to pivot going forward. That's where we're lost right now. We have this assumption going into the 21st century that if you didn't bootstrap some way, somehow, then you didn't do it. But the generation that says that got a lot of support to get to their bootstrapping, as it were. And so we have to come together as a country to do this, whether it's ownership, whether it's rental. Okay, so who, so who's the historical figure? Oh, Jesus. Not Jesus. Not... <laughs> that was, yeah, no. Uh, although he's a good carpenter right here. I have a good one. Can I can I offer one based on what I said? I was I was inspired to bail him out. So I agree with him. I think, you know, and and all of our I'm not going to name any of the names of these clowns on Sand Hill Road, but American dynamism is the new, you know, topic du jour, right? In our industry. I want to be funding American dynamism, whatever the the heck that means. So I'm gonna give you somebody who actually practiced American dynamism back in the day. I hope this person is dead because I know I asked, oh no, he's still alive, but I'm going to give you him. His name, are you familiar with a guy named Vinton Cerf? Ooh, yes, but he's not dead. He's not dead, but this was a dude who, who clearly like was involved with the government in the creation of DARPA and ARPANET. And this was an example of the U.S. government. That's why they call it, by the way, that's why they call it surfing the web. That would be so awesome if that were true. I don't think it's true, but I, I just made that up. It's not true, but like. You heard it here like, first. Yeah, it's, it is true now. Yeah, so like that was an era, to your point, when America was sort of leading the world in terms of innovation. And, and, and you would like to sort of replicate that in a more equitable way that's all right it's we sometimes think now that we're leading the world in innovation especially in some of these subjects but we still have some of the old rules in place so there's nations that can leapfrog past where we're getting stuck right now and my hunch is we can get back to something a little bit better just like the whole agenda around darpa and that season of our country when there was exceptionalism tied with proactivity right and we sometimes disassociate those now Ooh, that's good that's exactly it because without that then I just think I'm the greatest guy in the world and I'm going to go sit back and tell everybody I am without actually doing anything. So I just I just looked up Vinton Surf and today happens to be his 80th birthday. So happy 80th birthday to a very influential figure in our industry, one of the creators of DARPA and ARPANET. My grandfather, Jules Ahrens, who as I'm sure you've been to his website many times, was a space scientist and a street portrait photographer. And he used ARPANET back in the day in the 70s to communicate with other astrophysicists in places like Sweden on the Arctic Circle and in Israel and Italy. Um, and so I remember in the early 80s when I was really little, him telling me about ARPANET. And I was just like, what is this guy 
No, I like that as an example. I, I, I appreciate the phone a friend opportunity there. Thank you, Professor. No problem. I'm always available. <laughs> Tim Swanson, CEO and President of Inherent L3C. Tim, where can our listeners find you and learn more about Inherent L3C? Yeah, uh, you can check us out at inherenthomes.com. Uh, and uh, we are Snapchatting every day. It's one of my favorite things. I don't know. Somebody on my team, I think, is uh, or TikTok gang or until that's shut down by the government. I don't know. So, uh, <laughs> but just hit the website. It's the fastest way to get us there. It's already been banned in Montana. I had to drive over to Iowa to download it. And then I drove back into Montana. Which is the weird thing. You No, he left New York. He's like, I got to see what this ban is about. Yeah. Went to Montana. Went to Montana, documented myself not downloading it. Obviously, bought carbon offset offsets because that's what the yeah. man is. It, and then, no, well, I used I, I I drove a Rivian the whole way. Really? No, come on. I don't. I wish I had a Rivian. One of our founders has one. It's so cool. Uh, we got. We should talk about how much money that guy's making. Thank you so much for coming on today. Um, please go visit Inherent L3C, inherenthomes.com. Tim, thank you so much for being a good sport and coming to pitch and being brave and presenting your bold vision to Tangent. Thanks for tuning in to Tangent Tank, solving the housing crisis. Don't forget to follow, rate and review Tangent and share this episode with a friend. This series is edited by Daniel Mora and produced by me, Edward Cohen. Remember, collaboration is our superpower, so stay curious and always be learning.